Hi, and welcome to the lecture on Chapter 34 in your text, Patients Who Have Special Challenges. After you complete this chapter and related coursework, you will understand the special needs of patients who have developmental, sensory, and physical disabilities. You will also understand the unique anatomy and physiology, as well as assessment and treatment needed for these patients. Special care considerations for patients who rely on medical technological assistance are discussed, as well as the considerations to manage obese patients. Regarding the National EMS Education Standard competencies for special patient populations, the EMT will apply a fundamental knowledge of growth, development, and aging, as well as assessment findings to provide basic emergency care and transportation for a patient with special needs. Specific to patients with special challenges, you will recognize and report abuse and neglect, as well as understand the health care implications of homelessness, poverty, bariatrics, technology dependency, hospice and terminally ill, tracheostomy care and dysfunction, home care, sensory deficit and loss, and developmental disability. Specific to trauma, you will apply fundamental knowledge to provide basic emergency care and transportation based on assessment findings for an acutely injured patient. For special considerations regarding trauma, you will also understand the pathophysiology, assessment, and management of trauma in a patient who is cognitively impaired. Today, more people with chronic diseases live at home. One reason is that society's focus on decreasing the length of hospitalization, as well as um, improvements in medicine and medical technology. Some examples of patients with special needs include children who were born prematurely and who have associated respiratory problems, infants or small children who have congenital heart disease, patients with neurologic diseases such as occasionally caused by hypoxemia at the time of birth, in the, for example, in the case of cerebral palsy, patients with congenital or acquired diseases that result in altered body function that requires medical assistance for breathing, eating, urination, or bowel function, and patients with sensory deficits, such as hearing or visual impairments. Geriatric patients with chronic diseases requiring visitation from a home health care service are another category of patients we may deal with. Some people living at home depend on mechanical ventilation, intravenous or IV pumps, and other assisted devices. Please do not allow yourself to be distracted by the noise and mechanics of the medical equipment. Your focus needs to remain on the patient. You should focus on airway breathing and circulation, and if the emergency is a result of mechanical failure, use your ambulance equipment or the family's go bag. Developmental disability, more commonly referred to as mental retardation, is caused by insignificant cognitive development of the brain. It results in the inability to learn and socially adapt at a normal development rate. Some of the possible causes are genetic factors, congenital infections, complications at birth, malnutrition, environmental factors, prenatal drug or alcohol use, fetal alcohol syndrome, traumatic brain injury, and poisoning, for example, with lead or other toxins. Characteristics of development, developmentally disabled patients may include they may appear slow to understand or have a limited vocabulary, and they may behave immaturely compared to their peers. If severely disabled, they may not have the ability to care for themselves, communicate, understand, or respond to surroundings. They may rely, or you may have to rely, on patients and family members for information to help you understand how well the patient can understand you, to understand how the patient will interact with you, and to gain additional medical information regarding your patient. One component of all of this is patient anxiety. Patients may have difficulty adjusting to change or a break in their routine, and they may become more difficult to interact with as their anxiety increases. You should make every effort to respect their wishes and concerns and take as much time as necessary to explain, in a calming, understandable way, the treatment the patient is about to receive. Patients with developmental disabilities are susceptible to the same diseases as other patients. The first condition we're going to talk about is autism. Autism is a pervasive developmental disorder characterized by impairment of social interaction. Some other characteristics include severe behavioral problems, repetitive motor activities, and impairment in verbal and nonverbal skills. This is a wide spectrum of disability, and patients fail to use or understand the nonverbal means of communicating. 
They frequently have difficulty making eye-to-eye -eye contact. They do best with simple one-step instructions. They tend to have trouble answering open-ended questions. They tend to talk in a robotic or monotone speech pattern. They may repeat phrases over and over again. They may confuse pronouns. For example, instead of saying I, which is what they really mean, they will say you. Or they may not speak at all. There is no simple explanation of why autism develops in children, but about 1 in 150 American children is diagnosed. It affects males four times greater than females, and typically the diagnosis will be reached by the age of three. Children with autism receive special instruction and care in school-based settings. It is also likely that some older adults with autism have never been diagnosed, nor have they ever received any assistance. Generally, patients with autism do not have other medical disorders and will have medical needs similar to their peers who do not have autism. You need to rely on parents or caregivers for information and keep them involved within the treatment concept. The next condition we'll discuss is Down syndrome. Down syndrome is characterized by a genetic chromosomal defect that can occur during fetal development and it results in mild to severe mental retardation. Some of the factors that are risk factors for a Down syndrome child is an increased maternal age and a family history. Some associated abnormalities and conditions include seeing a patient who has a round head with a flat occiput, they have an enlarged protruding tongue, they may have slanted wide set eyes and folded skin on either side of the nose that covers the inner corners of their eye. They have short wide hands and a small face and features. They may have congenital heart defects and thyroid problems as well as hearing and vision problems. Their teeth may be misaligned and they have other dental anomalies and they have speech abnormalities and may suffer from epilepsy. They are at an increased risk for medical complications and as many as 40% of Down syndrome patients may have heart conditions and hearing and vision issues. On mask, mask ventilation can be challenging because of their facial features. Two-thirds may have congenital heart disease. Intubation may be difficult due to large tongues and small oral and nasal cavities, and remember, as I said in the previous slide, mask ventilation can be challenging, but the jaw thrust maneuver or a nasal airway may be necessary. Here we have a picture of a child who has Down syndrome. It is normal to feel somewhat uncomfortable when initiating contact with a developmentally disabled patient. However, you should treat the patient as you would any other. Approach them in a calm, friendly manner, watching for signs of increased anxiety or fear. Have the members of your team hold back slightly until you can establish rapport with the patient. Introduce your team members and explain why you're there and what you're going to do. Your movement should be slow and deliberate. You explain beforehand what you're going to do, just like you would with any other patient. You need to watch carefully for signs of fear or reluctance from your patient and make sure you're at their eye level. Do your best to soothe them, especially their anxiety and discomfort, as you work through your assessment and provide treatment. By initially establishing trust and communication, you will have a much better chance for a successful outcome. Brain injury. Patients who previously had experienced head injuries may be difficult to assess and treat. You should take the time to speak with the patient and family to establish what is considered normal for the patient or baseline. Talk in a calm, soothing tone and watch the patient closely for signs of anxiety or aggression. Do not expect the patient to walk to the ambulance or stretcher and treat them with respect, use their name, explain procedures, and reassure the patient throughout the process. We'll ne talk next about some of the sensory disabilities. The first is sight or visual impairment. Some of the possible causes are congenital defects, disease, injuries, or degeneration of the eyeball optic nerve or nerve pathway, for example, with aging. Degree of blindness may range from partial to total, and some patients lose peripheral or central vision. Some can distinguish light from dark or discern general shapes. Visual impairments may be difficult to re impairments may be difficult to recognize, and you should look for the signs that the patient is visually impaired. To interact with a visually impaired patient, you need to make yourself known when you enter the room. Introduce yourself and others in the room, or have them introduce themselves so that the patient can identify their placement and voice. Retrieve any visual aids to make the interaction more comfortable for your patient. A patient who is visually impaired may feel vulnerable, especially during the chaos of an accident scene. The patient may have learned to use other senses such as hearing, touch, and smell to compensate for the loss of sight, and the sounds and smells of the scene may disorient them. Tell the patient what is happening, identify noises, and describe the situation and surroundings, especially if you have to move the patient. 
patient ambulation. They may use a cane or walker and be sure that if they do, you take it with you. A service dog can remain in the room and will provide reassurance for the patient and prevent delays in transport. However, you may need to make arrangements for the care or accompaniment of the dog. A patient who is ambulatory may be led by a light touch on the arm or elbow or the patient may rest his or her hand on your shoulder. You may ask patients which method they prefer to use and they should be gently guided but never pulled or pushed. Obstacles need to be communicated in advance. Hearing impairments. The hearing impairment may range from a slight hearing loss to total deafness. They may have difficulty with pitch and volume. They may have the inability to speak distinctly. They may speak even though they have never heard sounds. Parkinson's disease or other disease processes may cause patients to slur words, speak very slowly, or speak in a monotone. Some of the most common forms of hearing loss are sensory neural deafness or conductive hearing loss. First, sensory neural deafness results from nerve damage. It occurs or can occur from a lesion or damage to the inner ear. And elderly people may have some degree of sensory neural hearing loss because of advanced age. With conductive hearing loss, some of the reasons that you may have conductive hearing loss is caused by a faulty transmission of sound waves, and this can occur when a person has an accumulation of wax within the ear canal or a perforated ear eardrum. Some clues that a person could be hearing impaired include the presence of hearing aids, poor communication or poor pronunciation of words, and failure to respond to your presence or questions. This slide shows different types of hearing aids. One A is the behind the ear type on your left. The next over to your right is the in the canal type. C is the completely in the canal type. And D is in the ear type. Some communication techniques that may help you. You can use a piece of paper and a writing utensil. You can assist the patient with finding and inserting hearing aids. These can be either external or internal, depending on the type of hearing damage the patient has, and you can face the patient while you communicate. Do not exaggerate your lip movements or look away, and position yourself approximately 18 inches directly in front of the patient. Most people who are hearing impaired have learned to use body language, for example, hand gestures and lip reading. Do not speak louder, and you can also try to lower the pitch of your voice. Ask the patient, how would you like to communicate with me? American Sign Language may be useful. Um, you can use an interpreter, a family member, or a friend, or you could take a class in ASL. If an interpreter is not readily available, call your receiving facility early on to request one. Some helpful hints for communication. Speak slowly and distinctly into a less impaired ear or position yourself on that side. Change speakers to one with a low-pitched voice. Provide paper and pencil so that you may write your questions and the patient may write responses. Remember, only one person should ask interview questions to avoid to confuse the patient. And you can also try the reverse stethoscope technique. Put the earpieces of your stethoscope in the patient's ear and speak softly into the diaphragm. Hearing aids. Hearing aids are a device that makes sound louder. There are several types available, and we saw the pictures earlier. The behind-the-ear type contain, are contained in a plastic case that rests behind the ear. The conventional body type or older style used for profound hearing loss. The in-the-canal and completely in-the-canal types contain, are contained in a plastic case that fits partly or completely inside of the ear canal. And the in-the-ear type are contained in a shell that fits in the outer part of the ear. There are also implantable options available like cochlear implants. The devices should fit snugly, and if whistling occurs, the hearing aid may not be in far enough or the volume may be too loud. If it is not working, troubleshoot the problem. Cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a group of disorders characterized by poorly controlled body movement. Some of the possible causes include a result of brain damage or result of damage to the development develop me, developing fetal brain while in utero traumatic brain or injury at birth or early during childhood, and postpartum infections such as meningitis. The symptoms can range from mild to severe and include poor posture, uncontrolled spastic movements of the limb, visual and hearing impairments, and difficulty communicating. They may also have epilepsy or seizures, and 75% of patients have some type of developmental 
developmental delay, or mental retardation. They have an unsteady gait called ataxia, which may necessitate wheelchairs or walkers, and if so, you take the equipment with the patient. And they may, again, have seizure disorder. You need to observe their airway closely because they may have increased secretion production and difficulty swallowing or dysphagia. They may require aggressive suctioning to clear the airway. Some important considerations include not assuming the patients are mentally disabled. Limbs are often underdeveloped and are prone to injury. And patients who have the ability to walk may have an ataxic or unsteady gait and are prone to falls. If the patient has a specially made pillow or chair, for example for pediatric patients, they may prefer to use it during transport. Pad the patient to ensure comfort and never force their extremities into any position. Whenever possible, take walkers or wheelchairs along during transport and be prepared in case the patient has a seizure and keep suctioning readily available. Spina bifida is a birth defect caused by an incomplete closure of the spinal column. The spinal cord and undeveloped vertebrae are exposed and the opening can close surgically, can be closed surgically, but it does leave spinal damage. Some associated conditions include hydrocephalus, and you must remember that most patients who do have spina bifida also have hydrocephalus. Hydrocephalus requires the placement of a shunt to drain excessive amounts of cerebrospinal fluid from the brain. Partial or full paralysis of the lower extremities may be present, and they may have loss of bowel and bladder control. They will probably also have an extreme latex allergy, and you should ask patients how it is best to move them before you provide transport. Paralysis. Paralysis is the inability to voluntarily move one or more body parts, and some possible causes include stroke, trauma, and birth defects. Patients may have normal sensation or hyperesthesia, which is an increased sensitivity, and they may also cause communication challenges if they have facial paralysis. The diaphragm may not be functioning correctly, and they may require the use of a ventilator. Patients may have specialized equipment like urinary catheters, tracheotomies, colostomies, and feeding tubes. They may also have difficulty swallowing, which will create the need for suctioning. Each type of spinal cord paralysis requires its own equipment and may have its own complications, and always take great care when you lift or move a paralyzed patient. You should ask the patients or their caregivers how it is best to move them before you provide transport. Bariatric patients. Obesity is a condition in which a person has an excessive amount of body fat. The result of an imbalance between food eaten and calories used and the causes are not fully understood. It may be attributed to a low metabolic rate or a genetic predisposition, and obese is generally dis defined as anybody who is 20 to 30 percent over their ideal weight. Severe or morbid obesity um, is anybody who is 50 to 100 pounds over their ideal weight, and it afflicts about 9 million adult Americans. Persons are often ridiculed publicly and may be victims of discrimination, and their quality of life may be negatively affected. Some associated health problems with morbid obesity include diabetes, hypertension, heart disease, stroke, chronic joint injury or osteoarthritis, and they may have a complex and extensive medical history. Patients may be embarrassed by their condition or be fearful of ridicule as a result of past experiences. If it is necessary to transport, plan early for extra help. Send a member of your team to find the easiest and safest exit and do not risk dropping the patient or injuring a team member by trying to lift too much weight. You always need to remember to be respectful and treat your patient with dignity. Ask your patient how it is best to move him or her before you attempt to do so. You need to avoid trying to lift the patient by only one limb, which would risk injury to their, injury to their overtaxed joints. And you need to coordinate and communicate all moves to all team members prior to starting a lift. If the move becomes uncontrolled at any point, stop, reposition, and resume. Look for pinch or pressure points from equipment because they could cause a deep venous thrombosis. Very large patients may have difficulty breathing if you lie them in a supine position. Many manufacturers make specialized equipment for morbidly obese patients, and some areas have specially equipped bariatric ambulances for these folks. Become familiar with the resources available in your area and plan your egress routes to accommodate large patients' equipment and the lifting crew members and notify your receiving facility early. Patients with medical technology assistance. 
Some of the things we're going to talk about include tracheostomy tubes, mechanical ventilators, apnea monitors, internal cardiac pacemakers, left ventricular assist devices or LVADs, central venous catheters, gastrostomy tubes, shunts, vagal nerve stimulators and colostomies and ileostomies. Tracheostomy tubes are a plastic tube placed in a surgical opening from the anterior part of the neck into the trachea. They can be either temporary or permanent and it passes from the neck directly into the major airways. These are generally indicated for patients who depend on home automatic ventilators have or have chronic pulmonary medical conditions. The tube bypasses the nose and mouth. Here is a picture of a standard tracheostomy tube. Because it is foreign to the respiratory tract, the body reacts by building up secretions in or around the tube. Tubes are very prone to becoming obstructed by mucus, plugs, or foreign bodies. The obstructions of the tracheostomy tube are emergency events that could lead to cardiopulmonary arrest. We use the DOPE mnemonic to help you recognize in, um, causes of obstruction. So four letters, D-O-P-E, and this is what it stands for. Displacement, dislodged, or damaged tube. Obstruction of the tube from secretions, blood, mucus, or vomitus. Pneumothorax or pulmonary problems. And equipment failure, such as the tubing is kinked, the ventilator malfunctioned, or the oxygen supply is empty. Some common problems that may occur with a tracheostomy tube include there may be bleeding or air leaking around the tube, it can become loose or dislodged, and the opening around it may become infected. Management includes maintenance of an open airway and suctioning the tube if necessary to clear a mucus plug. Maintain the patient in a position of comfort and administer supplemental oxygen and provide transport to the hospital. Mechanical ventilators. These are used when patients cannot breathe without assistance. Some of the reasons that a patient may have a mechanical vent includes congenital defects, chronic lung disease, traumatic brain injury, and muscular dystrophy. The disease process that weakens the, any disease process that weakens the, inability, the ability to breathe and requires a permanent tracheostomy and mechanical ventilator. If the ventilator malfunctions, remove the patient from the ventilator. Begin ventilations with a bag mask device attached to a trach tube. The masks that are used may be designed specifically for patients with tracheostomies, and you cover the tracheostomy hole and it has a strap that goes around the neck. These may not be available in a pre-hospital setting, and you can improvise by using a simple face mask over the stoma. The patient's caregivers will know how the mechanical ventilator works. They have been trained on the equipment. Apnea monitors are used for infants who have been born prematurely and have severe gastroesophageal reflux that causes choking episodes. They may also have a family history of sudden infant death syndrome or have experienced a previous alt or apparent life-threatening event. Generally, they're used for two weeks to two months after birth to monitor the respiratory system, and the monitor sounds an alarm if the infant experiences bradycardia or apnea. The monitor is attached with electrodes or a belt around the infant's chest or stomach, and it will provide a pulse oximetry reading that will assist you in assessing the patient's respiratory status. If possible, bring the monitor to the receiving hospital with the patient. Internal cardiac pacemakers. This is a device that's implanted under the patient's skin to regulate the heart rate. It's typically placed on the non-dominant side of the patient's chest or for smaller, extremely thin patients in the abdomen. The pacemaker may also include an automated implanted cardioverter defibrillator to monitor heart rhythm. You never place defibrillator paddles or pacing patches directly over the implanted device and ask the patient about the type of cardiac pacemaker in any documents they have and you document this appropriately in your report. LVADs are left ventricular assist devices. This is a special piece of medical equipment that takes over the function of either one or both heart ventricles. It's used as a bridge to heart transplantation while a donor heart is being located. You provide support measures and basic care, use the caregiver as a resource during transport, and you may need to be prepared to provide CPR. The risk factors that are associated with the implantation of LVAD devices include excessive bleeding following the surgery, infection, blood clots leading to strokes, and acute heart failure. Venous, central venous catheters are venous access devices with the tip of the catheter in the vena cava. They're used for many types of home care patients receiving chemotherapy, long-term antibiotic or pain management, high concentration glucose solutions, or hemodialysis. Some common locations include the chest, the upper arm, and the subclavicular area. And here you see a picture of a central venous catheter. 
Some common problems associated with central venous catheters include broken lines, infections around the lines, clotted lines, and bleeding around the lines or from the tubing attached to the line. Gastrostomy tubes or G-tubes. These can also be referred to as gastric tubes, more commonly G-tubes. They're placed directly into the stomach for feeding patients who cannot ingest fluids, food, or medication by mouth, and they may be inserted through the nose or mouth into the stomach using an NG or an oral, oral gastric tube. They may be placed surgically, and they're typically sutured in place. Here's an example of a patient, as you can see on his abdomen, who has a, a G-tube. They may become dislodged during the patient's normal daily activities, and you should assess for signs or symptoms of bleeding into the stomach. They may complain of a vague abdominal discomfort, nausea, vomiting, especially if it appears coffee grounds-like, or blood in the emesis. Patients may be at an increased risk of aspiration, and you should always have suction readily available. Patients with difficulty breathing should be transported while sitting or lying on the right side with the head elevated by 30 degrees. And diabetic patients who receive insulin and G-tube feedings may become hypoglycemic quickly. Shunts are for patients with chronic neurologic conditions. These are tubes that extend from the brain to the abdomen to drain excess cerebrospinal fluid. There are two different types, a ventricular peritoneal shunt, which drains excess fluid from the ventricles of the brain into the peritoneum of the abdomen, and the ventricular atrium shunt, which drains excess fluid from the ventricles of the brain into the right atrium of the heart. The shunts keep pressure in the skull from building up, and they um, are a fluid reservoir. They are devices beneath the skin on the side of the head behind the ear, and it should alert you to the possibility that the patient has an underlying shunt. If a shunt becomes blocked or infected, you should note the following changes. You may see changes in mental status and respiratory arrest may occur, and infections generally occur within the first two months after shunt insertion. Some signs of distress include bulging fontanelles in infants, headache, projectile vomiting, altered mental status, and irritability, as well as a high-pitched cry, fever, nausea, difficulty with coordination and walking, or blurred vision. Also seizures, redness along the shunt track, bradycardia, and cardiac rhythm disturbances. Vagal nerve stimulators are an alternative treatment to medication for patients with chronic seizure disorders. They're surgically implanted in patients when medications fail to resolve seizure activity or if the patient is not a good candidate for brain surgery. They stimulate the vagus nerve to keep the seizure activity from occurring. They're used in children who are older than 12 and they're located under the skin and they're about the size of a silver dollar. If you encounter a patient with this device, contact medical control and follow your local protocols. Colostomies and ileostomies. These are surgical procedures that creates an opening or stoma between the smaller large intestine and the surface of the body. They allow for elimination of waste products into a clear external bag or pouch, which is emptied or changed frequently. You assess for signs and symptoms of dehydration if the patient has been complaining of diarrhea or vomiting. The area around the stoma is prone to infection with the following signs. Redness, warm skin around the stoma, or tenderness with palpation over the colostomy or ileostomy site. Some guidelines for patient assessment of patients with special challenges. Interaction with a caregiver of an adult or child with special needs is an important part of the patient assessment process. Remember, these caregivers have become experts on caring for the patient. You need to determine the patient's normal baseline status before you make an assessment and ask the question, what is different today? Home care. Home care occurs within a patient's home environment and it applies to a wide spectrum of needs and services. Some needs include um, infants, the very elderly, people with chronic illnesses, or people with developmental disabilities. Services include delivering prepared meals, house cleaning, washing laundry, yard maintenance, physical therapy, and personal hygiene such as bathing and wound care. You may be called to a residence by the home care provider and you need to obtain a baseline health status and history from them. Hospice care and terminally ill patients. Terminally ill patients may receive hospice care at a hospice facility or at a home with, with diseases such as cancer, heart and lung failure, end-stage Alzheimer's, and AIDS. Many do not have, many of these patients have do not resuscitate orders, and they may have medical orders for the scope of treatment. In Montana, our post forms gives us both the do not resuscitate and the scope of treatment. Comfort care 
Is pain is some of the things that we can do to make a patient comfortable. For example, pain medications are provided by hospice during the person's final days. We also call this palliative care, and it improves the patient's quality of life before the patient dies and allows them to be with family and friends. Follow your local protocols, the patient's wishes, or legal documents, such as DNR order. All necessary documentation must be brought to the hospital if the patient is to be transported. If the patient is at home, the care you give will have a lasting impact on the family. Show compassion, understanding, and sensitivity. Ascertain the family's wishes about having the patient remain in the home or having them transported. And if a family member requests to accompany the patient, they should be allowed to do so. Follow your local protocols for handling the death of any patient. Poverty and homelessness. People who live in poverty are unable to provide for all of their basic needs, such as housing, food, child care, health insurance, and medication. Some disease prevention strategies, such as dental care, nutrition, and exercise, are likely absent, which leads to increased probability of disease. Homeless populations include people with mental illness, victims of domestic violence, people with addiction disorders, and impoverished families. You need to remember, you, as an EMT, are an advocate for your, all patients. Your job is to provide emergency care and transport to the appropriate facility, and all health care facilities must provide assessment and treatment regardless of the patient's ability to pay. You can be an advocate by becoming familiar with the social services resources within your community. In summary, medicine and medical technology continue to improve. However, the number of children and adults with chronic diseases or injuries living outside of the hospital continues to grow. Assess and care for patients with special needs in the same manner as all other patients. Developmental disability is caused by insufficient development of the brain, resulting in the inability to learn and socially adapt at a normal developmental rate. Down syndrome patients will often have large tongues and small oral and nasal cavities, and remember, intubation may be difficult. A patient who is visually impaired may be difficult to recognize, and you should look for the presence of eyeglasses, a cane, or a service dog, and make yourself known when you enter the room. Introduce yourself and others in the room so that the patient can identify placement and voice. Hearing impairment. It may range from a slight hearing loss to total deafness, and some of the signs include the presence of hearing aid, poor pronunciation of words, and failure to respond to you. Cerebral palsy. Patients may have an unsteady gait and require a wheelchair or a walker, and some associated conditions include vision and hearing impairments, difficulty communicating, epilepsy, and mental retardation. Patients with spina bifida may have partial or full paralysis of the lower extremities, loss of bowel and bladder control, and an extreme latex allergy. Bariatric patients may be embarrassed by their condition. They may be fearful of ridicule as a result of past experiences. If transport is necessary, you plan early for extra help and send a team member to find the easiest and safest exit. Tracheostomy tubes are for patients who depend on home automatic vents and have chronic pulmonary medical conditions. Mechanical ventilators are for patients who cannot breathe without assistance and if it malfunctions, take them off the mechanical vent and start ventilations with a bag mask device. Apnea monitors are typically used for infants who are premature, have severe gastroesophageal reflux that causes episodes of choking, have a family history of SIDS, or who have experienced an apparent life-threatening life event. Internal cardiac pacemakers are devices implanted under the patient's skin to regulate their heart rate. LVADs, or left ventricular assist devices, are special medical equipment that take over the function of either one or both of the ventricles, and they're used as a bridge between heart disease and transplant while a donor heart is being located. G-tubes or gastrostomy tubes are placed directly into the stomach for feeding in patients who cannot ingest fluids, food, or medication by mouth, and they may be inserted through the nose or mouth or placed through the abdominal wall surgically. Shunts are tubes that extend from the brain to the abdomen to drain excess cerebrospinal fluid. Colostomies or ileostomies are surgical procedures that creates an opening between the small or large intestine and the body's surface, and it allows for elimination of waste products into an external bag or pouch. Interaction with the caregiver of a child or adult with special needs will be an important part of the patient assessment process. Patients requiring home services involve a spectrum of special health care needs, and terminally ill patients may be in a hospice facility or at home. Thanks for your attention, and as always, bring questions or comments to your instructor in your face-to-face -face class.